Well, hey there, everybody. I'm Dr. Mark Catella, broadcasting you to you today from the conference room that is next to my office and across from my lab. And what I want to talk about today is controlling extraneous variables. And you might first ask, what is an extraneous variable? It's anything, there we go, it's anything that's outside of your study that could have an impact on your results. So for example, uh, it might be the day of the week that you run your research on. So when we're running participants um, here, usually people run on like Monday nights, Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, sometimes Thursday nights, but nobody runs on Friday nights or, or Saturday nights because the people who would show up to be in that study are significantly different probably than people, the people who show up on the weekend are probably different than people who would show up during the, the, the rest of the week. And so we try to stick to that. But it could be any of a number of issues. Uh, it could be the time of day that you run people. So 6 a.m. versus 6 p.m. It could be the amount of light in the room, um, et cetera. And so there's a lot of different extraneous variables. And so let's just talk about how we deal with physical variables first. <clears throat> and this would work in um, within subjects designs or between subjects designs. But this is for physical variables. The first thing that our first way we can deal with them is through elimination. And this is exactly what it sounds like is if there's a problem, get rid of it. If you need a soundproof room, then run your research in a soundproof room or soundproof the room. I had a colleague who used to do sensation perception research and the amount of ambient light coming in made a difference if, if, it was day, if it was day when they were running the research or night. And so what they did was they just uh, blacked out the windows by covering them, uh, there's windows over here, by covering them with aluminum foil and then um, putting blackout curtains over that. So they eliminated um, the light coming in from outside as a extraneous variable. I'm going to put a star next to this one because it's very important, which is constancy of conditions. What constancy of conditions means is to the greatest extent that we can, we run everybody the exact same way. Because, uh, so like for example, in terms of a research protocol, if we can, let's run everybody in the same room on the same day of the week, so like always run them on Wednesdays, always run them at the same time, let's say seven o'clock, and, uh, and always use the same researchers, the people who are giving the instructions. Because constancy of conditions controls for extraneous variables that we haven't even identified, okay? Maybe day of the week's important. That constancy of conditions, if we always run it on Wednesdays, uh, then we're able to account for that. So. Uh, it allows us to control for variables that we haven't even identified. Maybe the, the person who's running the research makes a difference. We don't know. The last thing that we can do is what's called balancing. And so let's say we have um, two different rooms that we're running our research in that we can't do constancy of conditions. So we're going to be very sophisticated and call them rooms A and B. What we don't want to do, and let's say we have two treatment conditions in experimental and control. We don't want to run our experimental condition in room A and our control in room B, because then what you're doing is you're systematically linking the independent variable with the extraneous variable of location, okay? And so, what you want to do instead is you want to balance the effects of running in two different rooms across your, your treatment conditions. So you're going to run half of your experimental group and half of your control in room A and half of your control and half of your experimental group in um, room B. And so we balance it across this extraneous variable, across location, so we're not systematically linking location to the independent variable. Here's the thing, is most of the time extraneous variables are not that important. 
because uh, research findings tend to be robust, which means that they hold up across different situations, and so we don't need, really need to worry about them too much. So I'm not saying forget about everything I just said. I'm saying um, they're not often that much of a problem. I need to pick this up. Okay. Let's talk about controlling for progressive error. Um, controlling for progressive error. And this is a problem in, within subjects, within groups, designs. Because every person is in every possible condition. And so uh, what progressive error is, is as you progress through the study, maybe your behavior gets better, maybe it gets worse. If it gets better, that's positive progressive error. And that's due to a practice effect. If it gets worse, then that is usually fatigue or boredom. And so you're like, oh my gosh, I'm sick of being in this study. Uh, and so the people to start, um, they, don't want, they don't want to work on it anymore. So how do we control for progressive error? Well, we do what are called, what's called counterbalancing. And there's three different types of counterbalancing that we do. Uh, let's talk about, um, well, the first is called subject by subject counterbalancing. Um, I've never actually seen it in the real world, but I talk about it because uh, a lot of textbooks talk about it. Um, so I'll put counterbalancing. Let me reiterate, this is just for um, within subjects, within groups, designs. Let's say you have two conditions, condition A and condition B. Uh, there's an order effect there if B always follows A. So what you do in subject by subject counterbalancing is you run people in condition A, then condition B, then condition B again, and then condition A again. And then you combine condition A and condition B. So everybody's in the study. Uh, you're not just in every condition, you're in every condition twice. And the idea behind this is that progressive error increases as you're in the study. And so by combining one and four and two and three, uh, one and four is five, uh, two and three is five. And so there's the same amount of progressive error in both. I'm gonna put it this way, like the Swedish supergroup ABBA. Similarly, if you have conditions A, B, C, three different treatment conditions, C, B, A, same principle, one, two, three, four, five, six, I could count all day. One and six is seven, two and five is seven, three and four is seven. Uh, but again, no one runs their research like this because it's utterly insane. Uh, people don't want to be in the study for that long anyway, and then you're doubling it. So forget about subject by subject counterbalancing, at least in your own research. Complete counterbalancing. is used all the time. Uh, so it, let's go back to our original example. Let's say we have two treatment conditions, A and B. What we do is we run half of our participants, A and B, and then the other half, what do you think? B, A, okay? And so the number of treatment orders that we have is always the number of treatment conditions we have factorial. So two times one, and so therefore we have um, two different treatment orders. Uh, you can think of this in another way. Let's say if we have three different um, treatment conditions, A, B, and C, how many different complete counterbalancing treatment orders do we come up with? Well, three factorial is three times two times one, which is equal to six. So it means we run some people A, B, C, A, C, B, B, A, C, we'll just put them all up here, B, C, A, C, A, B, and C, B, A. And so that is complete counterbalancing. So this would be the first person who comes into the study. Uh, that's the order they get. Second person, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and you, so you get the idea of how that works. 
complete counterbalancing works if you have two or three treatment conditions. Uh, if you have four treatment conditions, how many different treatment orders do we have? Four times three times two times one is equal to 24. That's a lot of, that's unwieldy, I guess. And five, five factorial, that's 120. No one runs 120 different treatment orders to try to um, eliminate progressive error. So we have to do something else. And that something else is what's called incomplete counterbalancing. And we use this when we have uh, four uh, or more different treatment conditions. And so uh, the way this is set up is the first person gets A, B, C, and D, because that's our um, four different treatment conditions. Okay, then the second person who comes through gets B, D, whoops, A, C, and then the next person who comes through gets uh, C, A, D, B, and the next person who comes through gets D, C, B, A, and then it goes back to this one again. So the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. Okay. It's called incomplete counterbalancing because no treatment ever follows another treatment more than once. So here B follows A, here it's first, here it follows D, here it follows C. Similarly, A is first, A follows D, A follows C, A follows B. And so incomplete counterbalancing is what we use when we have four or more treatment conditions. One last point, the science uh, that this incomplete counterbalancing comes from is ag science, agricultural science, because they plant different seeds in different parts of the field um, in that way because they have different drainage and different sun and everything else. I don't know if they still use that, but that's, that's where it came from. So that is my talk about controlling for extraneous variables and controlling for progressive error. So I hope that you're having a great day wherever you are. And I'll see you again soon.